east bank of the Suez Canal, Israeli troops were running to safety. Bombing and shelling woke them up from their holiday rest on October the 6th, 1973. Absolutely unexpectedly, the Egyptians attacked during the midday hours. Almost without retaliation from the Israeli side, they used landing craft to transport tanks, trucks, cannons and soldiers across the canal. On their truck, Israelis had attached an image of their enemy, the Egyptian president Sadat. The surprise attack launched on Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement, the holiest day in the Jewish calendar, was a part of the Egyptian strategy. The Israelis needed a few days to recover from the shock and to replace their losses in equipment through American resupplies. Finally, the tide of the war turned. Owing to their superior weapons, their better morale, and the greater effectiveness of their strategy, the Israelis were able to repel an Egyptian offensive into Sinai and to drive the advancing Syrians out of the Golan Heights. Sadat had anticipated the Arab outrage over the American and Western aid to Israel. Earlier, during his visit to Cairo, Sadat had met with King Faisal of Saudi Arabia and had asked him to threaten to use the oil weapon to suspend oil exports and to raise the prices of oil. We do not wish to place any restrictions on our oil export to the United States, but as I mentioned, America's complete support of Zionism against the Arabs makes it extremely difficult for us to continue to supply the United States petroleum needs and to even maintain our friendly relations with the United States. King Faisal announced the oil embargo in November 1973. The use of the oil weapon proved unusually effective. In the USA and in Europe, the embargo caused massive shortages of oil and gas, which led to a fourfold increase in the prices of oil. Also in Germany, car-free Sundays were implemented. The US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, was supposed to persuade King Faisal to lift the oil embargo. No, I had extremely high regard for King Faisal. He was one of the outstanding leaders in the Middle East at that period. He came, of course, from a different world than the one to which I was used. Uh, not only he was an absolute king, and so technically the meetings took place with him and me sitting in the middle of a room and our advisors looked like being half a kilometer away along the wall. I mean, that's exaggerated, of course. Kissinger was received with all honors. He had arrived on President Nixon's request. For reasons of domestic policy, the president wanted to reverse the high oil prices as quickly as possible. But. Once I was used to his particular way of approaching matters and his necessities, he was extraordinarily helpful. Uh, I, uh, I wrote in my memoirs one episode in which he and I had talked for three hours and I had told him what we could do and he had told me what he thought we should do and much of this was for the record. But then when he took me to the door, he said in English, I pray to the Lord Almighty for the success of your noble efforts based on your proven ability. In other words, go ahead and do what you told me you were going to do. Kissinger wanted to negotiate a peace treaty and used his legendary shuttle diplomacy moving between the two parties, the Egyptian President Sadat and the Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir. The agreement called for Israel to concede a large part of the Sinai to Egypt, which Israel had occupied in 1967, in exchange for an initial unofficial recognition of Israel's right to exist by Egypt. All I hope is that this effort will, con will continue Till we reach the peace based on justice in this world. Sadat already felt like a winner. 
as he had been able to restore his damaged prestige following the loss of Sinai in the devastating defeat of 1967. He didn't need the oil weapon anymore for which he had asked the Arabs. We were facing someone who is very clever, Dr. Henry Kissinger, and he was able to diffuse the tension and did what is called step-by-step -step solution until everything is done and he deprived the Arabs from that power in their hands. He was very clever. Kissinger's negotiations, which had been dragging on for weeks, displeased Nixon. He was in a hurry and according to newly released 30-year-old declassified British Secret Service documents, was considering a military invasion of Saudi Arabia, Bahrain and Qatar in order to seize the oil fields in those countries. In the files which were made available to Prime Minister Heath, the British Secret Service reaches the following conclusion. We believe that the American preference would be for a rapid operation conducted by themselves to seize oil fields. We had people who were talking in case of embargo that the oil weapon would be used and that the military force would be used. Uh, I don't think it ever reached the point of asking Britain to support such a thing. It is possible that at meetings Nixon might have described that these people existed and it's possible that he's said this and if that's what the British records say it's probably true. The immediate reaction of the Americans is to form a committee by President Nixon to invade the oil fields in the area. We know the names of the members of the committee and they decided at the very end, at least the oil members in that committee, that it is very risky to make the invasion. But they decided to invade the Saudi fields, the United Arab Emirates fields and the Kuwaiti. They had some problems with the Kuwaiti fields because at that time Saddam Hussein was in line with the Russians and they were afraid that they might have some problems over there. But they kept that as a secret, confidential. He did not, Dr. Kissinger, did not say it completely, but he was threatening the Arab oil producers not to overdo it. It is risky that America has several means. King Faisal also approved the result of Kissinger's shuttle diplomacy. During the Arab summit in Algiers in spring of 1974, he bolstered his support for Sadat. Before, he had lifted the oil embargo against the United States. I never made any demands in the literal sense. We wanted the oil embargo lifted. It was actually, in retrospect, a silly demand because oil being fungible, uh, we didn't need the oil from Saudi Arabia. We could buy it elsewhere and and then others could pick up the Saudi oil that we would normally have received. So I think we probably spent too much effort on getting the oil embargo lifted. Tehran also profited from the fourfold increase in world oil prices. All the same, the Shah reacted indignantly when asked in a personal letter by Nixon to reverse the high oil prices, considering their catastrophic impact on world economy. The Shah responded with moralizing self-righteousness. They will simply be obliged to tighten their belts. Eventually all these children from well-off families who have plenty to eat every meal, who have their own cars and who sometimes behave like terrorists and now and then even throw bombs, will have to revise their attitude towards these aspects of the modern industrial world. And they will have to work harder. Due to Iran's oil boom during the 1970s, Tehran became a sprawling metropolis with a population in the millions, undergoing rapid growth in population and a frenzy of high-rise construction. 
A hint of shabbiness and the old-fashioned, domestically manufactured automobiles have a faded charm that is reminiscent of Eastern European cities. The Shah could have done more for his country had he not, like the Saudis, spent a large portion of the oil revenues to finance arms purchases of hundreds of American-made fighter aircrafts, including the most modern Phantom Jet fighters, of thousands of British-made chieftain tanks, and of investing into a new navy in an attempt to extend his role as the local gendarme in the Gulf, also over the Indian Ocean. Saudi Arabia now became really rich. Even the people were able to share in the nation's oil blessing. The symbol of this was the Datsun pickup, the top-selling car at the time. It's cheaper to maintain a Datsun than to keep a camel, the saying went. The capital city Riyadh quickly developed into a boom town with wide streets adapted for the growing automobile traffic, modeled on a distinct American-style city, a Dallas in the desert. The image of Saudi Arabia was equal to that of a colorful and strong tree in a film made by the oil company Aramco. Workers posing in front of an oil tank, they're now regarded as a new social class, but they're not allowed to organize themselves. Free health care was provided to all Saudi Arabian citizens. However, only the large companies offer high quality health care services. Because of the high unemployment, the oil industry can only employ a small number of workers, the state also pays unemployment support in specific cases. After the Yom Kippur War, King Faisal hesitatingly nationalizes the last Aramco shares of American stockholders. He thus follows the example of other oil exporting countries in the region. To have the source of their wealth at their disposal was a long coveted dream for the oil producing countries in the Middle East. With mistrust, they followed the upswings and downswings in the prices of oil at New York's and Rotterdam's oil stock markets. For them it was a sign of dependency on the European colonial powers and the USA, as well as on their oil companies, the Seven Sisters, who dominated the market. Not until the early 60s of the last century were they able to break their power. The long period of growth in the Western world during the post-war era was coming to an end in the late 1950s. Suddenly, there was too much oil on the world market. The large oil corporations had to lower their prices, even the posted price, which guaranteed a specific percentage for the oil-producing countries. Additionally, the prices came under pressure from the Soviet Union. Showing an appetite for foreign currency, the Soviet Union had doubled its oil production between 1955 and 1960, owing to the opening up of new oil fields in Siberia, and thereby flooding the market with cheap oil. A 7% reduction of the posted prices for Mideastern oil, without any consultation, especially outraged the government in Saudi Arabia. She found support in distant Venezuela. The idea for resistance, however, stemmed from a clever woman, Wanda Jablonski, a Czech oil journalist living in Cairo. She arranged a meeting in Cairo between the two most powerful oil ministers of the time, Abdullah Tariki from Riyadh, who wanted to expel the American oil companies from Saudi Arabia, and Juan Pablo Alfonso from Venezuela, who was not a friend of the Americans either, to convince them of the need for an organization of oil producers. Both acted quickly. In September 1960, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Kuwait, as well as Iran and Iraq agreed in Baghdad to found the Organization of Petroleum Producing Countries. The main demands of the five founding member states, whose countries produced 80% of the entire crude oil exports, were co-determination on all decisions related to the price, fair and stable prices, as well as solidarity on the producer's part. Resolution by OPEC, it is to stabilize the price of oil, 1960. Later on, the, some OPEC member countries went up to their head and they pushed the price up because they can make more income, more revenues. The rising prices of oil had also gone to the Shah's head. He wanted more. 
Even from a skiing vacation in St. Moritz, he intervened in price negotiations with brusque demands. He believed that the Americans owed him, the advocate of their interests in the Gulf, higher prices. The Saudis were angered over the irksome rival. They wanted to observe the law of supply and demand. Nevertheless, they were also trying to slightly manipulate the market mechanism. Production quotas were supposed to cut short the supply in the interest of increasing prices. The Shah, like others too, did not observe the quotas. It went up to their head. OPEC, they don't know what they want. They're becoming very greedy. The regular conferences of the OPEC oil ministers unfolded into a haggling over oil prices which they jointly wanted to impose on the oil companies. Saudi Arabia, as the largest producer country, was not always able to dictate the prices. The green flag of Saudi Arabia with the sword and a saying from the Quran announces King Faisal's visit to Washington, D.C. After the revocation of the oil weapon, he was a welcome and highly respected guest in the USA. Faisal was seen as a guarantor of stable oil prices and a reliable U.S. ally in the Arab world. Shortly after his return from the United States, King Faisal was assassinated in his palace. Deeply affected by King Faisal's death, a grand procession of mourners, including President Sadat and an array of Western statesmen, escorted the king's casket for an unadorned Islamic funeral. The king was murdered by a nephew from the large cohort of royal princes. Was he insane, as officially proclaimed, or was he an extremist? The deed raised many questions regarding the inner state of the kingdom. At the end of 1979, tensions in the country broke out again. On November the 20th, 1979, 500 militant Saudi Islamists stormed the Grand Mosque in Mecca and took hundreds of pilgrims hostage. The religious scholars had to approve of the help of French special security forces to overpower the terrorists, as the bearing of arms inside the mosque was prohibited. The leader, a militant Islamist, accused the Saud family of corruption, of oppression of the people, of westernization and of close ties to the American infidels. He demanded a return to the pious ways of the forefathers. He and 68 other terrorists were executed. In spite of increasing religious tensions also in Iran, the Qatars celebrated New Year's Eve in Tehran. The Shah became arrogant, mentally unstable, that there will be a revolution in Iran. He cannot continue ruling with this mentality. 1978 was a year of unrest in Iran. The Shiite opposition used the dissatisfaction with the regime, which despite the high oil prices, had not been able to reduce the country's poverty to its advantage. It instigated strikes and demonstrations. A general strike of the oil workers led to the collapse of the Iranian oil production. The Shah lost control over his empire. Demoralized, he left the country on January the 16th, 79. But the Western nations have to decide when they advocate particular policies, what price they're willing to pay. Uh, in Iran, we brought in a uh, fundamentalist government by the doubts some people had about the Shah. Now, no doubt the Shah was not an ideal ruler, but I tend to think in retrospect that if he had stayed in office, Iran in all likelihood today would be a constitutional monarchy. Ayatollah Khomeini, who had directed the unrest from his exile in Paris, returned triumphantly to Tehran at the beginning of February. He was received jubilantly by the crowds. The Islamic revolution had won. Almost all groups within the population hoped that the revolution would bring about an improvement of their living conditions. 
No, Khomeini wanted no democracy. He merely wanted a form of democracy that allowed him to exercise all power. I believe Khomeini harmed himself in being a despotic ruler. In Tehran, the new rulers opened the central prison of the Savak, the notorious and dreaded secret police of the Shah, for a tour by the international press. A mock demonstration of Savak's routine torture methods was given. Forms of torture included whipping on the soles of the feet, day-long standing at the wall and the tearing out of fingernails. During that time, I was tortured with beatings and electroshocks on nine different parts of my body. They tormented me as well as torturing me with electroshocks. A short time later, the prisons are filled again, this time with prisoners of the Mullah regime. The frightened family members are lined up as before, hoping for information about the victims. Lotfola Maizami has been publishing a journal titled Perspectives for a few years now. He's critical of the politics of the Ayatollahs and looks up to his great model Mossadegh, the Iranian national hero, who still remains widely revered for having expelled the British oil magnates from the country. Freedom of speech exists, but not freedom after speech. Still today we can publish all we want to say and write, but afterwards we are cited to appear in front of a court. We are accused of weakening the regime and of spreading lies. Despite disappointments with his Islamic theocracy, Khomeini remained popular. His leading executioner, Ayatollah Kalkali, on the other hand, was hated. At the beginning of the regime, he had ordered executions of thousands of people. Among his victims were co-workers of the Shah, dissidents and infidels, as well as homosexuals, drug addicts and prostitutes. We had never imagined that Khomeini would turn against his own people with weapons. Khomeini proved that he was not only capable of turning weapons on the people, but also that he was willing to accept the killing of innocent people. At the beginning, in the prisons, 50 people were executed every night. Later, the number rose to 300 or 400. On November the 4th, 1979, a group of militant university students stormed the American embassy in Tehran, taking 62 members of the embassy hostage. They were held prisoner for 444 days. Khomeini needed an enemy to justify his tyranny. None was more obvious for him than the great Satan, the USA, who had now even admitted the Shah for medical treatment of cancer. We called almost anyone we could think of. I personally called the foreign ministry, I called the prime minister's office, and that was a rather frustrating experience. I think it was the foreign ministry or th that I called, and I was talking to a secretary there, a, wom uh, a woman, and I explained the situation, and I explained that if someone did not take decisive action quickly, uh, they, there could be bloodshed and that they would be responsible for the, conse for the consequences. Well, before I could, I could get any farther, she interrupted me. She asked me about the passports they had sent over for visas and said, are those visas ready? Um, and I said, if you don't do anything, uh, you're, you can kiss your visas goodbye. There, 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 won't be, there won't be any visas. The jubilant student crowd was able to continue the siege of the embassy unhindered. The police remained in the background. The crisis escalated. The prime minister's office uh, was not very helpful. Uh, they finally, they first said, oh, we're, we're sending some help over, don't worry about anything. And when the help didn't come, 
uh, and this was about 11 o'clock, 10.30, 11 o'clock in the morning, they said, well, we've decided we're this afternoon around three or four o'clock, we're going to have a meeting to talk about what to do. Um, and it was very clear from then that point on uh, that we were on our own. Dressed as Uncle Sam, a larger-than-life Carter doll was dragged on a hangman's rope through the streets and was thrown into the dust. The USA felt that its interests in the Gulf were threatened as Soviet troops were marching into Afghanistan at the same time. In January 1980, the already voted out of office president put forward the Carter Doctrine as a precautionary measure. Let our position be absolutely clear. An attempt by any outside force to gain control of the Persian Gulf region will be regarded as an assault on the vital interest of the United States of America, and such an assault will be repelled by any means necessary including military force. After their release on January the 20th, 1981, on the day of President Reagan's inauguration, the hostages returned to Washington, D.C. via Algiers. A happy John Limbert was among them. It may be, for all I know, but I've never seen any documentation, documents or anything prove, uh, proving that. But after this time, you know, after all this time, that that story is still very much, very much out there. The other, I mean, it's a fact that we did not leave Tehran uh, until about half an hour after um, President Carter left off, uh, uh, left office. Uh, there was whether that was the result of a deal or whether that was simply that the people holding us had a particular dislike for Carter. I mean, a real reservoir of hatred for and resentment for him. And this was kind of a last insult uh, to him. Um, I suspect the latter, but I can't be sure. The rumors that Reagan had negotiated the release of the hostages with the secret promise of arms sales to Iran can hardly be verified as documents relating to the affair, along with the later illegal Iran-Contra affair files, were destroyed by Reagan administration officials. At the beginning of 1981, Iran had already been fighting a war with Iraq for a few months. Saddam Hussein attacked Iran as he had an eye on the oil-rich Iranian border regions along the Shat al-Arab waterway. What's more, he hated and feared Khomeini because of his influence over the Shiites in Iraq. He believed that he would be able to overthrow the still chaotic Ayatollah regime in a bi-weekly blitzkrieg. His tank units were able to rapidly capture the port city of Khorram Shah, close to the border. But Saddam Hussein had miscalculated. Iranians were able to maintain their position after the first onslaught. They recaptured Khorram Shah and immediately launched a counter-offensive. They were, however, too weak to conquer Iraq. This led to an eight-year-long static war. On both sides, the war is fought with unimaginable cruelty. Saddam Hussein deploys chemical weapons produced with German help, not only against the Iranians, but also in his own country against Iraqi Kurds, living in border areas such as Halabja. Altogether, more than 200,000 Kurds were murdered under Saddam Hussein's regime. On the front, the Iraqis were not prepared for the surge of human beings from the Iranian side, for hundreds of thousands of Iranian soldiers. Many died as martyrs for Khomeini. Others were taken prisoner by the Iraqis. Among them were numerous children whom Khomeini had mobilized as a last reserve. Khomeini was determined to destroy Saddam Hussein and to carry the Islamic Revolution into Iraq. A miscalculation. After eight years of war, both countries were left in ruins, and so much blood had been shed that they had to make peace. Khomeini's messianic figure also encouraged the large Shiite minority in Saudi Arabia, in the oil province on the east coast, at the end of 1979, to rebel and protest against discrimination at the hands of the Wahhabis. The unrest was quelled with the use of force. 
it was very peaceful. Actually, many of, of, of the Shiites were killed in, that, uh, in those demonstrations, but it was peaceful. Shiites in Dammam were not allowed to build their own mosques and schools. Aramco considered them unreliable and pro Khomeini and thus refused to employ them. Aramco is especially a high security closed society. Out of consideration for the oil fields and peace in the country, Riyadh in the end had no other choice than to gradually improve the living conditions of the Shiites. We, we used to be the majority employees in Aramco. So they said uh, they were afraid those people might be loyal to another country and they are the majority in Aramco, so it is uh, dangerous. So we have to, they made a decision to stop employing them to reduce the percentage of the Shiites in Aramco. During the Iran-Iraq war, Tehran time and again stirred Shiite unrests, especially during the annual pilgrimages to Mecca. It did not recognize the Saudi dominance over the holy sites of Mecca and Medina. In July 1987, an especially high number of Iranian pilgrims took to the streets of Mecca, carrying Khomeini and anti-Saudi banners. The Saudi security forces acted brutally and ruthlessly towards the demonstrators. According to unofficial statements, 400 Iranians were killed. On both sides, there was also a political motive for their actions. Tehran was outraged over Riyadh's financial aid to its enemy, Saddam Hussein. Riyadh sided with Iraq because it was afraid of Iran's aspirations to supremacy in the Gulf. In Tehran, there were public mourning rallies. There, the former Iranian president, Rafsanyani, spoke of the royal family in Riyadh as an evil clique and of the Saudis as Wahhabi hooligans. But Saudi Arabia had no peace. In 1982, King Fahd ascended to the throne during difficult times. The king, who was generally considered a liberal reformist, reacted to the incidents between militant Islamists and the Shiites with a renunciation of reform steps. The sinking oil prices in the 1980s let the national budgets slip in the red and lowered the revenues. The wealthy royal dynasty was once again met with criticism by the Wahhabi clergy. The escape into foreign affairs could distract the agitators. The king financed the fighting of the Mujahideen in Afghanistan and the Saudi Islamic extremist participation in the Jihad against the Soviet Union. The attempt of the Soviets to support the pro-communist regime in Kabul and to contain the advance of Islamic fundamentalism in order to prevent it from spreading to the Muslims in the south of Russia threatened to fail due to the inability of the invading army to cope with the guerrillas at the Hindu Kush. With the help of Saudi Arabia and the USA, the Mujahideen, who now had brand new weapons at their disposal, were able to inflict one defeat after another on the Russians. This policy was of additional advantage for King Fahd. He was able to assign a mission in Afghanistan to Osama bin Laden, who was becoming dangerous to the royal dynasty at home and who had therefore been stripped of citizenship. In order to maintain Saudi Arabia's claim to leadership within Islam, the Saudis also financed the Mecca-based Muslim World League. The League is the missionary center of Wahhabism. The third general Islamic conference convened there in October 1987, during which Islamic representatives from 134 countries condemned the Shiite Iran. In the Balkan Wars of the 1990s, the Wahhabi missionaries played an important role. Not only did they support the Muslim fighters, but also built the gigantic new mosque in Sarajevo. As 11 years before, during the revolt in Mecca, King Fahd once again needed the support of the Wahhabis for a fatwa, a religious justification. He asked for American help against Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait. The top Wahhabis noted that while it is true that Americans were infidels, in this case, however, they were defending Islam in the kingdom. For decades, Sheikh Abdul Aziz Ben Baz was the supreme religious authority of the Wahhabis, and thus the most powerful man after the king. Only one single photo exists of him. 
The Iraqi attack on Kuwait in summer of 1990 came as a complete surprise to the ruling dynasty. They were afraid Saddam Hussein was not only after Kuwaiti oil, but was also planning to invade the bordering oil-rich Saudi Arabian eastern province. Saudi Arabia felt ill-equipped to handle a Gulf War at its front door. Very soon, 200,000 American male and female soldiers were stationed in the country. King Fahd was aware of the risks of his policy. Even Crown Prince Abdullah, the present king, was against it, fearing the Wahhabi hatred of America. President Bush, however, was determined to thwart access to the Kuwaiti oil by the dictator in Baghdad. Most Americans know instinctively why we are in the Gulf. They know we had to stop Saddam now, not later. They know that this brutal dictator will do anything, will use any weapon, will commit any outrage, no matter how many innocents suffer. They know we must make sure that control of the world's oil resources does not fall into his hands, only to finance further aggression. With the Operation Desert Storm, Americans unleashed their superior military machinery. Bombs and missiles hailed down on Baghdad. Fighter aircrafts and tanks crushed the Iraqi ground troops in the Kuwaiti desert. The strict Wahhabis saw their fears confirmed that infidels corrupt the morals of the people. The driving ban for women had to be confirmed by a fatwa from the religious scholars. The American presence in the country strengthened those who stood for reforms in the political and religious systems. Female American soldiers behind the wheels of military and private vehicles made many Saudi women aware of their disenfranchisement. On November the 6th, 1990, 50 educated women drove their cars in the streets of Riyadh in a protest rally against the driving ban. During that time, the Kuwaiti women came in and they were driving and uh, enlisted women in the army, in the American army were driving and if somebody talks to them and says to them, listen, you know, the Saudi women are, Saudi, uh, women are not uh, allowed to drive here, they would say, they would just push them away and they say, just leave us alone, we, are, we don't care about your rules and regulations. Uh, for us, some activists, women who are, you know, very, came very spontaneously together. We were not a political movement. We are not, you know, uh, an organized uh, group. We came together very spontaneously because we saw this is happening. And we said, okay, I mean, this is an opportunity for us to protest and to say, you know, we want our rights to be activated. We don't want this... Uh, gap between the rights of women. We don't want to, the injustice or the prejudice against women. So we took the driving, uh, uh, fino uh, driving aspect as a symbol, symbol for everything that we wanted to change in our situation and in our positions. So we drove because the, the, it was fluid at that time, you know, with, women were driving and we said okay if they if foreign women can drive then we can drive and we went out into the street yes and we drove in protest the inhabitants of Riyadh depend on their car as there is hardly any public transportation during rush hour traffic the traffic is as dense as in major western cities and is often congested the people who attacked us more on the street were not the police or the you know, the, uh, the people, you know, from the police, uh, police departments. Uh, the, actually, the fundamentalists, you know, the people who are, um, their thinking is extremist. They are the ones who heard about it because we were driving for about 45 minutes. And they heard about it and they came from all over the Riyadh and they started attacking the, the, the cars and the people in the car. And some of us, some of the women were pushed, some of us were spat upon, you know, some of us were really manhandled, it was very bad. The police were a lot more gentle and a lot more, uh, you know, we, we wanted to be 
you know, caught by the police, but not by the fundamentalists. And uh, they took us to the police station, and we stayed there. They, of course, uh, it was not a very long time, and it was not major. But when we came back out, the next day, I think 24 hours later, we were all um, fired from our jobs. All of us were fired from our jobs. And then, you know, a huge campaign of uh, really, how can I say, of hate started in, within the society. They called us names and they said that we are, you know, against Islamic values, against traditional values, that we are, you know, maybe, you know, wayward. We're not, you know, we're not uh, nice people. That's what they said. They said bad, bad things about us. And we were out, to, and our passport was also confiscated. We couldn't travel for about a year or so. In the evening hours, the big shopping streets turn into a quasi-amusement park for the Jeunesse Dorée, the youth from well-to-do families. The street is the only place where they can let off steam. Wahhabis do not allow cinemas. Cafes and restaurants are a male-only domain, inaccessible to women without their male escort. And contacts to strange men would be considered a violation of religious regulations. In cars, however, the girls are allowed to ride without having to cover themselves completely, but only if the driver is a brother or another close male family member. Dating attempts must therefore happen in the streets and on the roads. At the right moment, young men throw a note with their telephone number to a girl in the neighboring car. Saudi Arabia is an absolute monarchy. There is no parliament. Since the year 1993, however, there is a Shura Council, the King's Advisory Council. Its 150 members are appointed by the king and belong to the upper class. We need more time to convince people seeing women driving her car in Saudi cities. Well, uh, when I introduced uh, or initiated my, uh, my proposal, it is just to have a full study whether the Saudi society will accept women driving cars and uh, we have to know uh, what is the uh, advantage and disadvantage of having women driving her cars. Is it good for a woman to drive her own car or to be driven with uh, uh, foreign drivers? Uh, how uh, we have uh, almost maybe up to one million foreign drivers in Saudi Arabia. It's costing us a lot of money. In addition to that, it is uh, uh, the, the, those uh, strangers or the new dri drivers came from outside. They came from a different cultural background, and they are dealing with the most precious we have: ladies, children, and uh, we don't know. And we have, I, I myself, I think there is an, a social impact of these newcomers and our social, in our social life. Therefore, I propose let's make study and see. And uh, we all, all what we could do in the Shura Council just to send our, the, the, the result of that study to the king. And he is the only authority to say yes or no. Also to the city's elegant malls, the women have to be driven by a male family member or an employed chauffeur. They cannot simply take a taxi. Once at the mall, they can move around relatively freely, but are only served by men, even when shopping for underwear. They are, nevertheless, allowed to spend money for expensive Western luxury items on their own. It became a shock to the Saudi society. Uh, ask people of uh, social sciences, scientists, economists, uh, politicians, uh, policemen, uh, religious people, to be together to make a study and then let the study known to people, even those women who have uh, some, uh, some, some rejecting uh, 
I don't know. They said 500 women, they wrote a petition to the king saying, well, no, we don't want the drive. Uh, nobody will force anybody to do it. It happened a long time ago when we first introduced the women education in Saudi society, Saudi Arabia. Many people rejected the idea. But because it is right of women to learn, so the king at that time, the late King Faisal, he said, well, I will open the school and who want to bring his daughter, that's fine. Who, will not, who, who, who said no, that's fine again. So now I believe uh, those who are rejecting the idea, nobody will force them to drive. But there are many Saudi women a desperate for driving their cars for necessity, not for uh, enjoyment or for anything, for necessity. We have uh, today in Saudi newspaper, we, they said, of 400 Saudi divorced, 400,000 Saudi divorced women. Who can help them if they can't help themselves? In the neighborhoods of Riyadh, there are, wrested from the desert, small parks and playgrounds, also for mothers and for children. But the eye of the law is never far away. The religious and the regular police work closely together. If they happen to observe something suspicious, like a western-looking cameraman, they appear at once. It was not always like this. When I was a young woman, a young girl in, in school, I was being taught the same things that, you know, that's being taught now to, uh, to girls and boys. Some of them, not all of them. There is more emphasis now on the, Islam, uh, on the religious education. But it didn't really affect me to make me uh, more fundamental and it did not affect it did not affect me to become anti west or anti you know globalization or anti uh, women no the the whole society the whole such culture was more open and you know uh, the religious mutawas in the street at that time when i was a child they were of old, you know, old men who are very gentle and they go, go around just, you know, for bu public safety, for public morals. And they actually, when I used to play in the street and they are there, I would feel safe if they are there when I was a child. But as, you know, things have actually ch changed and developed, we, the religious, uh, Mutawain, the religious police that are now, you know, around, uh, they go around, you know, the, the market and the streets to, for public morality, they've become very extremist. They're very young and they're very violent. They're young, you know, they're not, they're not old people, you know, they're really young people. And they, they have a violent culture in them, you know, themselves. They have a violent uh, psychology. So it's not the Islam. The police want to know if our team has a shooting permit. The escort from the Ministry of Information is able to convince the police that our cameraman is harmless, but he's also afraid. Fundamentalism came from a part, a group of people who took fundamentalist ideas and use those fundamentalist ideas to protest against existing conditions. So in effect, they are political, uh, they are politically motivated. They want to change the political situation. They want to change the, so the social structure of the society. And they took the precepts of that is there, and they said, look, you know, Saudi Arabia is not Islamic, we need to be more Islamic, and they, and they carried the idea forward. For 30 years they've been carrying it forward, and they're putting more stress, and they're putting more um, close, they're closing, they're closing the ideology of Islam, they're make, becoming, making it more restrictive. The ideology is already taught in the schools. A high-ranking Wahhabi traditionally heads the Ministry of Education. Public schools are Quran schools with religious instruction as their primary focus. Boys and girls are separately prepared for their role in society. 
education about the world outside of Islam or the transmission of a more profession-oriented kind of knowledge hardly takes place. I, I would say that any man who is open-minded and who is uh, concerned about the situation of women and who is actually um, fighting to restore her Islamic rights and to restore her position in society and to close the gender gap is a very, very exceptional man because there are so many privileges given to the Saudi man here that it is almost inhuman to say to them, please give it up. You know, it's like a king, you know, being told, please give up your kingdom. The King Fahd University in Dammam is the Harvard of Saudi Arabia. It's modern and well endowed. The country's elite is educated here, especially in the subject of petroleum engineering and industrial management. The students are carefully selected. It's a male-only university. Women have no role here. There is a gender gap in the educational system. The women are not allowed, for instance, to study uh, engineering. They're not allowed to study you know, certain parts of businesses. They're not supposed to go into geology and they're not supposed to go into um, some of the professions that will act actually make them work in the public arena. And for women not be able to be able to go to a major university like Petroleum, you know, the King Fahad University in uh, the Eastern Province, that's a big, a big, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, prejudice against women. The campus leaves a Western impression. Whoever studies here need not worry about their future. Here the unemployment, uh, the, the, the students uh, here don't uh, face any problem in unemployment because this university is the best. So uh, the companies come to us. For many Saudis, life does not seem so rosy and optimistic. Not far away from the King Fahd University, the areas right and left of the main roads look abandoned and downtrodden for many kilometers. And even in the petroleum's capital city of Dammam, there are also poor quarters. We need to make the income of oil reflecting on our society and I don't see it reflecting very well. We have a lot of poor, we have a lot of uh, families, they don't have their uh, houses. We had a lot of uh, need, uh, old and uh, handicapped people, they don't have uh, social security and social security is still uh, not well developed. There are, uh, they are trying to make it uh, uh, in a proper way, but uh, I think there is a lot of responsibility on us by having that much income. And I love to see that reflecting in all of the, all the members of our society, and uh, we shouldn't have uh, poor people in this country. Saudi Arabia is a country of harsh contrasts, true to the motto, one step forward, one step back. This is nowhere more obvious than in the desert which begins right behind the outskirts of Riyadh on a Friday, the Islamic holiday. On this day, many inhabitants are drawn outdoors for a picnic or for harmless entertainment, either for a camel ride as back in the days of the forefathers or for tournaments in skillfulness with quads that can be rented everywhere, an especially popular activity with male adolescents. If only in passing, the prayer times are still observed, but the mosques are far away. The country appears torn between the past and the future. And the fight for oil continues at the same time next week.